Today, I want to talk about a new solo and co-op friendly skirmish game that sends players exploring the depths of a space station at the end of the universe. Hey there, Philip here from Manning the Fort, and today's topic is Space Station Zero from Snarling Badger Studios. Space Station Zero, as the name implies, is a sci-fi game. It's also very miniatures agnostic for reasons that we'll get to down the way. While it is solo and co-op focused, there are rules that would let you fight against someone else while trying to overcome the challenges of the space station, um, but I think its real heart is in the solo co-op mode. And before we get into the review proper, I should say uh, this video is not sponsored by Snarling Badger in any way. I paid for my copy of this game myself. My print-on-demand copy, I've been told, is in the mail. Speaking of, the PDF for Space Station Zero is available at Wargame Vault for, I believe, $13 American, and the print-on-demand version is $18, and the print-on-demand comes with the PDF version as well. Not every game company does that, and so I really like to point out when they do. The game is designed to be played on a 22 by 30 board, which will be familiar to players of games like Kill Team and War Cry, but if you've got a different size board, you can just kind of mark it down to the requisite size. If you're not familiar with Snarling Badger, the company, you're probably at least somewhat familiar with the two people behind it. That is Vince Venturella and Adam Loper, aka Uncle Adam from Tabletop Minions. They're both very prolific hobby YouTubers and have a long history in gaming. This is their second game together. The first one was Rain in Hell, which is kind of a fantasy, obviously kind of demon-themed versus skirmish game. The objective of Space Station Zero is for a player or players to command their crew as they explore the depths of the eponymous space station. There are a lot of familiar sci-fi elements to this. There's a lot of things, it's, especially when it comes to, say, exploring a giant space station in a far-off realm of space, that remind me of like Blackstone Fortress, but the gameplay is not a hex-based board game like Blackstone Fortress. You're measuring your movement and doing things very much like you would expect in a war game. Now, the way that exploration happens has definite shades of a choose-your-own-adventure book, if you're at all familiar with those. Everybody starts on the same challenge. Challenge is their equivalent of a mission. And then at the conclusion of that challenge, you roll randomly to see where you go next. And various things happen during the course of your campaign that will determine which challenge you move on to or what event befalls your crew or individual crew members. Now, about half of the book is dedicated to laying out these various challenges. I believe there are about two dozen of them. I have not read the vast majority of them because I want to play this campaign and I don't want to spoil myself. But I have read the first challenge, which is the one everybody starts on, and I can tell you that it does a pretty good job of laying out how the game is going to be played going forward. The central mechanic of Space Station Zero is what's called a challenge test. It's your standard sort of dice pool sort of rolling where you have a target success number, you roll the dice in your pool, see how many successes you get. There are a couple of interesting things about the way Space Station Zero does its dice pool mechanic, though. One, it uses exclusively D12s. Now, if you're a longtime D&D &D player like me, or if you've already played Rain in Hell, you probably have a decent number of D12s lying around your place, but if not, you might have to pick some up. I, I did try to do some napkin math to see if I could make the probability curves work using a different denomination of die, say a d10 or a d20, but it's pretty clear to me that this was designed to be used specifically with a d12 and not, say, 2d6. So challenge tests can cover a variety of actions, from fixing a poison gas leak to disarming a bomb to shooting a rifle at a bad guy. The player picks up a number of d12s appropriate for the crew members' stats and their equipment, and rolls them. And in very general terms, every even-numbered result is a success that goes toward the total number of successes needed in order to succeed. Now, there is a second layer that gets added on top of this, which is for more complex tasks, only even numbers of a certain number or higher, say 4+, plus or 6+, plus, will count toward a success. It is this dual scaling that I think means you really do need to use D12s, and I probably didn't do a great job of explaining it. It's actually pretty simple once you get your head wrapped around it. It's also worth noting that challenges don't always involve fighting. Uh, in fact, again, in the very first challenge that you encounter, there's a table of four random potential threats that you'll come up against, 
and you roll two of them, and only one of those four has anything to do with any enemies. The rest are purely environmental hazards that your crew try, has to try to overcome before it does them in. And it very well might do them in. It's also worth noting that the crew can get kind of whittled down over time. And I, unless I miss something, there's not a replenishment mechanism. So once your crew's done, well, there's apparently a lot of crews hanging out at Space Station Zero, so you're welcome to start again. While the game is meant to be very challenging and unforgiving, it's also worth noting that uh, Vince and Adam are paying attention to things. In fact, I saw something on the Snarling Badger Discord the other day uh, from Vince that they're already looking at kind of detuning one of the challenges that was just a little bit too difficult to get past. Now, the combination of the random elements within a given challenge and the random order in which you will encounter those challenges lends to a lot of replayability, and that's going to be a word I use a lot, when, especially when we get to talking about how you create a crew. Now, the narrative premise of Space Station Zero is that crews from various small ships end up here. I think the, the base assumption is something to do with a faster-than-light drive malfunction, and instead of scattering your atoms into the cosmos, it drops you off here millions of light years from home, no hope of ever returning. All you have is this giant space station, most of which is relatively unexplored, and your options are slowly drink yourself to death or go down and explore. Now, what type of ship your crew arrived on and what kind of crew they are as a result is fully up to the player. Now, the ship and crew types hit a lot of sci-fi staples. You've got exploration ships like, say, the USS Enterprise. You've got what essentially amounts to space truckers, like the crew at the beginning of the Expanse. Uh, there's also medical ships, science ships, pirate ships, and of course, warships. The type of ship that a player chooses dictates what a majority of their models on the table must be. It also gives them some special abilities, and it gives the commander model some additional special abilities on top of that. Now, the next layer of customization has to do with how many crew members a given crew has, and this is very much a game of quality versus quantity. You can choose either four, six, or eight crew members plus the commander, and as you get fewer and fewer crew members, those crew members get individually better at what it is they do. The last way that crews can be customized is with something that the game calls Edge. This is a special bonus that the player picks when they form their crew, and it is something that distinguishes them from all the other crews of similar types. These can involve everything from heavy armor to time manipulation, nanobots, uh, being part of a hive mind, psychic powers. There's all kinds of fun stuff in here. So let's imagine for a moment that a player wants to make a crew of probably the most ubiquitous models in the history of tabletop gaming, Warhammer 40k Space Marines. Well, to begin with, they're warriors, so you're going to want to pick the warship archetype, most likely. Second, Space Marines are highly elite units, so most players would probably want to pick four crew members plus the commander. Finally, there is the Edge, and there's one that seems absolutely tailor-made for the Marines, and that is Armored Force, which gives them power armor effectively and makes them a lot harder to hit in combat. Now let's imagine on the other side of the fence you've got a crew on a science vessel. Maybe it's a civilization that is just taking its first steps into faster than light travel. Something goes catastrophically wrong and they end up here. In this instance, I'd probably pick a larger crew to represent their relative lack of experience. Obviously, they're going to be aboard a science or maybe an exploration vessel. And then when it comes to their edge, maybe you pick something like a harmonious society, which would be especially beneficial with a large crew because that means when crew members are within an inch of each other, they can grant each other rerolls. Finally, in the middle, you could have something like a hardened pirate crew who takes the uh, takes six members and the smuggler's edge, which will grant them access to additional high technology items, probably to represent all the booty they've stolen off of other spacers. And that's just three out of literally hundreds of possibilities that you could come up with. This level of customizability makes the game truly miniatures agnostic, in my opinion. Now, to once again harken back to Rain in Hell, uh, Vince and Adam were both very clear that, you know, what represents a demon in Rain in Hell could look like just about anything. In fact, I was playing around with some Necrons 
in Rain and Hell because they're big soulless destroying things. That tracks with demons, right? But still, it didn't feel quite right. In this instance, though, you could get away with just about any miniature collection you happen to have, even if it's only five miniatures to begin with, even if it's something you pull out of a board game somewhere. I was actually thinking you could probably get away with fantasy miniatures even. And if you're unfamiliar with the science fantasy trope, you can take a look at uh, the one that always comes to my mind is the old D&D module Expedition to the Barrier Peaks. Sorry for spoilers, but that module's been out almost 45 years. All in all, Space Station Zero looks like a really fun addition to my growing, quickly growing collection of solo miniature games. The art style is unique and looks great and does a really nice job of selling the sci-fi but still like vaguely mysterious feel that kind of backs the game up. The rules feel smooth if potentially rather unforgiving. You got to know that that's what you're signing up for. But like I said, Snarling Badger has already indicated that if something is overtuned and is just way too hard, they are willing to release some errata in order to make the game a little bit more winnable. Uh, it is worth noting on that score, though, that if you do order the print on demand through Wargame Vault, any errata is going to take significantly longer to make it into the print on demand book. Uh, I remember Adam discussing this with Rain and Hell. It's very easy for them to update the PDF version. Uh, it's literally just uploading a new file. But in order to update the print on demand, they have to get a new proof and all this different stuff done. So uh, that is something to bear in mind. Uh, I went ahead and ordered the print on demand anyway, because I just like being able to have a book to thumb through at times. But for actual gameplay, the PDF is typically going to be the most up-to-date version. And it's also a little cheaper. In my opinion, this game is for a player who wants a fun solo and or co-op uh, sci-fi experience, but with a Game of Thrones-esque potential body count. Also, it's for someone who either has or doesn't mind picking up a substantial number of 12-sided dice. I know I keep bringing this up, but it is the least used die in a given polyhedral set. So like I said, if you're a D&D veteran, probably no problem. If you found this video helpful, I would appreciate it if you like the channel and subscribed. Also, I have a Patreon now at the moment for as little as $2 a month. You can help monetarily support the channel, which helps me do things like pay for new game PDFs when they come out. Also, if you are interested in other sci-fi solo friendly games, I just put out my first battle report a few days ago as I record this. It is my first campaign turn for five parsecs from home. That game is a lot of fun, but also can be pretty brutal at times. Until next time, watch your step around that corridor, and thanks for watching.